your voice and help, help you to contribute to some of the conversations that are important. Everyone's here tonight because we recognise that disability and inclusion is really important, but we want to put that central to everything, not just on a night like this or not just in a strategy that's being implemented over the next two years, but that, that perpetuates and becomes something that is square in the middle of Jersey life and that all parts of Jersey ask the questions of that group. So whether it's the retail sector or the Chamber of Commerce or uh, uh, the next policy on parking or something like that, you know, we're not thinking about a piecemeal approach to disability and inclusion, but we ask the group that we're going to be putting, putting together to contribute to that at the beginning and on an ongoing basis. So that's just one of the things that we're launching this week. Yeah. So thank you, Sean. That very, very fulsome answer to my brief question. Great. So um, I can talk. If anyone that knows me knows that. <laughs> I can tell. No, which is, which is great to hear. So um, it's fair to say that in terms of legislation, until recent years... Jersey lacked behind the UK in terms of equality and diversity. But with the advent of discrimination law in 2014, including disability in 2018, what, what difference do you think that's actually made to lives of persons with disability in Jersey? Well, if we go back to what I said at the beginning, maybe we should be asking the people that live with disability more than I do. And I'm not just trying to be cryptic or swerve the question, but that just gets to the point, really, that we actually need to be asking the real people. But I think it has made a difference, and it's beginning to make a difference. And the important thing is we're having conversations like we are tonight and some of the things that we're going to see this evening. Um, and people are asking the very questions. And we have conversations with people um, about how you access things. I had a conversation with one of the constables recently about parking and disabled parking, about the blue badge scheme. The important bit that is that these things are uh, becoming normal questions, mm. not, a, not a separate question that we put, you know, we know there's an election coming up. Of course we want to see those things reflected in the election and people's manifestos and be careful I'll be coming to speak to you um, but we want them to be there for always not just for the next few years we want them to be truly embedded but the the legislation isn't finished yet no I think it needs to you know we need to keep on top of it we need to make sure it's doing its job that people are being held to account when they're not um, they're not fulfilling their obligations but also, you know, there are other parts of different legislation that we haven't yet got. Hmm. You know, one of the other things that we've been talking about a lot is about supporting carers, and I'm not talking about paid carers. It's great to see there's a campaign in the press this week to try and recruit and help recruit 100 new home carers. That's fantastic and well needed, but I'm talking about informal carers. We're talking about family carers, the husbands, the wives, the children of this world that care for people with long-term health conditions and disabilities. And we know that if we don't support those people then our economy, um, frankly, goes down the toilet and we're going to have, have real problems. So what we really need is every member support to develop a carer strategy and carer's legislation that makes carers, again, front and central, and people who have their own rights for an assessment and their own rights uh, to support, which we don't currently have in Jersey. Thank you. So one last question, because we are running out of time, Sean. So um, if you can be fairly brief on this one, if you can... <laughs> What, what one thing would you change in Jersey that would make a difference to the lives of people with disabilities? Oh, one thing. I think working together. Let's just go for that. I think it's a, we think it's simple in a small place, whether you're a state's department or a number of, you know, there are 400 odd charities on the island. Um, we need to work together. We need to listen to each other and, and sort of break down some of those overlaps and say, what value can we add to each other? as opposed to creating something new. So let's talk to each other, keep talking, and I think if we do that, we can uh, make Jersey a very inclusive place to be proud of. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks for those answers, and thank you to everyone for listening. I hope that you, you drew thank something you. out of that. I'll be back later um, to interview Lord Blunkett, but until now, I'll pass back to Nelson. Thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. That was Malcolm Ferry and Sean Ponting. We're going to take a 10-minute break, which gives you plenty of time to actually wander around and meet all the people here that have got something to say to you that is truly important. Ladies and gentlemen, please mingle around. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Embrace Our Difference event. Uh, up next, we have the Stroke Association. They have a video that they'd like you to watch. So please, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy.
I was suicidal after my strike. It was the most devastating thing that has ever happened to me. I was so scared, I didn't recognise my children. I couldn't move or walk properly. It ended my relationship, yeah. I don't know how I would have coped without the help from the Stroke Association. They were so supportive to me, um, coming to see me at home and um, helping me go to local meetings and meet, meeting other people. It's not just me that the Stroke Association helped, it's also my family and friends. Um, this is my moment of hope. I signed up to walk a marathon and it changed um, my whole outlook and the way that I saw myself and I stopped feeling like such a victim and started feeling like an actual survivor. One of the proudest moments of my life actually, definitely. My life isn't over, I have so much more to give and so much more to do and this isn't gonna hold me back. The Stroke Association saved my life. It gave me hope for the future. What a fantastic video. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jackie Cuthbert from the Stroke Association. Hello, Jackie. How are you? Now, I'm going to hand you the microphone. Could you please explain what your association is about? Thank you. So we're the Stroke Association um, and our aims are to reduce the number of strokes that are happening and also to support stroke survivors to their rehabilitation journey so that they can have a, a good future life, maintain hope um, and, and create their new normal for themselves. Oh, and we also do research, sorry. Is hope after strokes as well? So at the moment, we, we did some research recently um, of a number of stroke survivors, and the information that we were getting back was that um, 20, sorry, a third of stroke survivors, um, after they have a stroke, lose their home, um, sorry, lose their job. Um, and on top of that, 5% of stroke survivors lose their home. So it's about people using what they currently have, dealing with their situation, but actually how do they bring that back? How do they turn this situation around? And so we're about recognising that hope was the biggest part of that journey for people. Um, once you start to realise that there is a recovery for you, that there is a new normal for you, um, that's when you can, the hope starts to come back in in the journey as, it, as in the film. Um, I've recently been speaking to a lady who um, has taken up surfing um, in her early 60s after two strokes, never wanted to go in the water before, but again, that, that, the, the contentment that that brings, the mindfulness that that brings to her um, really helps in her recovery. And again, this is what's triggered the hope for her. Her situation has completely changed um, because she's been um, supported through that journey. Beautiful thing to do. You're right. Is that Thank you very much. You. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jackie Cuthbert from the Stroke Association. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, it's time to introduce a video from the Barrister Street Kitchens. Describe your experience just a uh, taster except everything. If you got the disability, 
all of them is going to people alive to work here. A happy place to work and you'll come in and you'll see all our lovely smiling faces. And it's really hard to find a job around Jersey. This came to look me job here. I now work in the MK Film Workshop kitchen upstairs doing a lot of sandwiches. I do reading in the print room and that basically means peeling away the unwanted vinyl from the logo. Oh, I'm, a, oh, I'm always the odd worker and a commuter to me downstairs. I work at the front of the house serving the customers doing cake. I like Rocket BSK and as this is my first time I haven't paid here. Since I work at BSK, I'm at a b &L. My brother works up in the print room workshop. He has a lovely kitchen and he has never left the house. And then since he's worked here, you can see by the smile on his face, he is more confident and he's been more talkable. BSK is just like our second home. My dreams are just to get a normal paid job in the future. It might take a while, but I'll get them. When I leave BSK, I want to work at the lifeguard at the Echo Bar. Now I've learned more skills. I feel confident working in a different cafe or something. I'll still come back here. I'll probably come back here on my time off, to be honest. Ladies and gentlemen, a charity that I'm very familiar with, which is Beresford Street Kitchens. We have a lovely lady here, this is Ella Vieira, who's going to step forward and say a few words on behalf of Beresford Street Kitchens. I promise I won't talk as much as Sean did, so you're fine. Um, so yeah, you've obviously just seen the video of all our workplace training that we do in the cafe and the workshops. Um, we've just launched our new BSK Academy. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is now we're at our adult education program. So we have different levels around that. We've launched our Discover program, which is a 12-week intensive training for people that may just need to, to get back into, into work. And then we've got our base course, which is around independent skills, so giving people knowledge around having a bit more independence for their life. It doesn't necessarily mean living on their own, it's just giving themselves a bit more independence on their own life. We have our takeoff course, which is aimed at employability skills, and then we have our Ignite pro our flight program, which is working on the independence and the employability skills that people have already, their pre existing knowledge, working, building on that, and then helping them gain skills to get jobs outside of BSK. So that's around CV work, mock interviews, working with other agencies to help people move forward. So we don't just do our workplace training, we do employability, we do adult education as well. It's our new program. So thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was Ella Vieira. We're going to go to a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back, and I think you'll find I'm going to be walking around and speaking to some of the people that have got something to say at the stalls that have been set up. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Embrace Our Difference event. Up next, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Stuart Penn. He's going to talk about uh, the present, his findings. Stuart, please step forward. Good evening, everyone. Handing a one-armed man a microphone when he needs to also use a clicker is not the way to go. <laughs> this could have all gone very disastrously wrong straight away. Um, hopefully you'll be able to hear me uh, with two prosthetic limbs on my feet as well. Standing still behind the lectern is not my forte. So I will be doddering to the right, and you can still hear me, and to the left, and you can still hear me. That's fine. Okay. So... I'm here today to uh, present to you the findings from the survey that we have been doing. Technology works. Excellent. Um, but first of all, I want to ask, why did we do a survey? Why did we go for all of this? Why did we ask so many questions? Well, quite simply because we've had strategies and there's legislation being brought in as well. We, we then had some sort of pandemic that put a stop to a lot of our work. Uh, but then we thought, well, we need to actually find out what people think. Because unless we're all willing to have a conversation about disability, about health conditions, unless we're all willing to actually work together in partnership to decide the way forwards, then that legislation and those strategies are all just words on a piece of paper that will sit on someone's desk. So the whole purpose of this survey was to get all of us talking, was to get all of us joining in and educating each other about what are disabilities, how can we make life more inclusive for everyone in Jersey. So I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes uh, going through the results or the findings of the survey. But most importantly, I'm going to show you the words from the people behind the survey. And I'm also going to chip in with some of my own personal anecdotes and experiences. The survey then was an independent survey performed by Four Insights. Uh, they used their panel and we also promoted it across the island via social media for the government of Jersey, um, which has a large following. However, the questions we were asking were deliberately provocative. They were deliberately challenging because we wanted to look at the myths, uncover them. What are the myths about disability inclusion? We wanted to scratch the surface and find out what are people's attitudes towards disability so that we can look at those, shine a light on those and turn it away from being a taboo and make it so that we can move forwards together. First of all, I'm going to tell you who filled in the survey. I won't pretend that I'm a statistician, stati one of those. I won't pretend that I'm one of those. I'm just going to tell you in layman's terms what we received and who filled it in. So we had 768 data sets that we've achieved, which I'm being told is a great statistical represent representative control. Um, the age groups was a brilliant spread. So as you can see there, we covered across all age groups from about 16 up with a nice selection. There's a gender breakdown there for you too to help you understand kind of what that representation was. We also asked people what their employment was as well. Because again, some of the myths that I hear are that disabled people generally are out of work. Well, actually, we've got people who answered these questions that are, have a disability and are in work as well. Which is, again, scratch back the myths. Let's look at the attitudes. Let's look at the results. But it wasn't just people with disabilities that were filling, filling this out. Here's the breakdown of that. Those people that identified themselves as having disabilities against those that identified as not having a disability. Rather than me now just keep showing you lots of slides with stats and numbers on, I've, we've picked out some key themes to cover. First key theme is that 81% believe that there's prejudice in Jersey against people with long-term health conditions or people with disabilities. 81% of us in Jersey believe that, that there is prejudice. That's a stunning fact to take away, if nothing else. But I like to flip things on the head. I'm very positive. I work in education. It's all about positives and ways forwards whenever you even get a negative in front of you. Actually, that's 81% of people who are willing to admit that and are looking for a way forwards, a way to tackle this. That finding is higher than the UK's. Here's the breakdown of what people said. So you can see the answers were yes, a lot, a little, hardly any, none, don't know. How it breaks down. 
Most of these key themes, we've tried to split out so you can see the differences, or if there was any difference, between how people with disabilities answered them compared to how people without disabilities answered them. 45% of people with a disability that answered this survey said yes a lot, compared to 28% of people without a disability that filled in the survey thought that they yes a lot. I'm going to point these out because, again, I work in education, and to me, a lot of this that we've found with these survey results is that it's all about educating each other. All of us educating each other about disabilities, the different forms of disabilities, what we can all do, the differences we can all make individually to actually make life more inclusive. What did people say about that? So the what did people say section after every theme is from the free text part of the survey where we ask people for their comments and thoughts. And then what we've done is I've then had a look at them with my incredible insight and actually picked out, okay, this was a comment about this key theme. Some people cause issues for disabled people, not deliberately, but simply by not realising the impact of their actions. What do you think about that? I think that's possibly the most eloquent and well put comment I've ever heard about that subject. Because it's true, even myself. You know, um, when I was asked to be the, honoured actually, to be asked to be the face of this campaign, I told a friend of mine who has an invisible disability. And the first thing she said to me was, well, they would get someone like you, wouldn't they? <laughs> so it's all of us. We all have some sort of way of excluding people or putting barriers or assumptions in front of ourselves. Just because we don't know enough, we don't understand. Next quote was, disability and inclusion courses should be mandatory in workplaces and schools. Fantastic. How can we learn if we don't know? How can we, not, how can we find out and learn if people aren't willing to teach us and willing to show us? That starts in school, but it's for lifelong learning as well, for all of us. Final comment on this from the people that filled in the survey was, the understanding of mental health and its disability connections, as well as the treatment of people with these type of disabilities, is awful in Jersey. This might be one person's opinion, but it's that one person we want to involve and we want to all work together to change so we don't get anyone thinking that in a future survey. Next theme then. Non-visual disabilities are acknowledged with most islanders disagreeing with disability being something they can see. That's brilliant. That's how the stats work out from it. So one, I'll have to keep reading these, completely against my understanding. 54% of people that filled in the survey were completely against that. Yeah? The, the, the disabilities are not just visual things. It's not just people with prosthetic limbs and bits of metal sticking out of them. It's not just people in wheelchairs. They're invisible with disabilities as well. This is amazing because for me, and I, this is a tentative connection, me not being a technical person that looks at data and ties it all together, but my tentative connection this is we have already started the learning because in a lot of the campaign promotional material to put this survey out there, we mentioned it's not just about visible disabilities. We started the learning process just by having this conversation. We're already on the track to a more inclusive jersey. How did that break down between people with disabilities answering this survey and people without? Actually, there's no difference. They all felt the same. So what did people say about that statement? Non-physical, invisible disabilities tend to be underestimated. Focus is applied primarily to visible physical disabilities. That's a fair comment. Just because a disability cannot be seen does not mean it should be ignored. Our next theme, schools, education and learning are regarded as the most accessible, closely followed by private and public health services. Now, yes, those of you paying attention will have noticed that I've immediately moved on to accessibility. So I've just talked about invisible disabilities and it's not just always about, but actually when we go to accessibility, we all, I'm sure, jump to this ramp that's down there or widen doorways. But what does that really mean, accessibility for invisible disabilities or for ones that are non visual. So schools and education and learning regard as the most accessible, followed close behind by private and public health services, which is great. Hospitality, restaurants, pubs and clubs rated the least accessible here in Jersey, closely followed by sports, gyms and rec recreation. How many of us like to go to restaurants, pubs, to the gym? 
What about if we couldn't get there ourselves or if it wasn't inclusive for us? How difficult would that be? I'm going to take some time now going through all of the different options to do with the accessibility question. Because I'm going to do that, I'm going to put the question up here so that we all remember what it was that we asked. On a scale of one to five, how accessible are the following aspects of Jersey? One being completely inaccessible and five being completely accessible. So I'm going through all the categories for you. Schools, education and learning, we've already said this was one of the most accessible. If we take a look on there, we can see that one is completely inaccessible, five is completely accessible. For those people answering one and two on the accessibility of schools, 21% of the people who had disabilities answered one or two. And only 11% of people who do not have a disability answered one or two. Shopping and retail. Now you can see straight away from the, the figures there that this is quite an even spread across. Shopping and retail is regarded as the most average in terms of accessibility when we were comparing it to the two different groups that I'm talking about, people with disabilities and people without disabilities. We still have people there, 25, 30% saying it was inaccessible. Government services and facilities. Now being a government employee, I was quite keen for this one to be good. Uh, and to be accessible for all. Um, and actually, it came away. Because let's face it, we all need to be able to access government services. Answering one as in completely inaccessible, only 12% of the people who had a have a disability that filled in this survey said it was completely accessible. That's an excellent figure, 12%. 3% of people who do not have disabilities answered that. Public transport. Again, looking at the score straight away, we can see actually our public transport comes off quite well with this survey. 26.4% of people with disabilities said it was completely accessible or on the way to it, as opposed to 36% of people without disabilities. Hospitality, restaurants, pubs and clubs. So from the theme, we know this is a difficult one. It's one that has been highlighted and accessible. We know that we have old buildings in Jersey if we're talking about accessibility as in ramps and doors, but what about everything else? 44% of people with disabilities that answered this survey said that it was completely inaccessible or inaccessible. That's nearly 50% of people with disabilities that answered this survey saying they couldn't access pubs, restaurants and clubs. But 40% of people without disabilities that answered this survey also said the same. So although we're talking about we want to all learn together, we want to all move together, there are points where actually our opinion is already there on the same level with each other. Sports, gyms and recreational facilities. Answering completely inaccessible was 13% of the people who have a disability that answered this followed by 5.9% of people who do not have a disability. And you can see by the, um, the percentages there underneath two, we've got 29% that thought they were inaccessible. Your place of work. If we're going to be working, we need to all be able to access it. Now, the pandemic was brilliant for one thing, and that was how much we embraced digital and virtual working, being able to work from home, turning our homes into our workplace. If I have a disability and I live at home, it will be accessible to me. That opens the door of world of work to people that possibly have not been able to access it before. The results from this were pretty good. 33% of people with disabilities answering four to five so completely accessible. So it's a third of people that answered this survey with disabilities thought their workplace was completely accessible. 46% of people do not have a disability thought they were completely accessible. Talked a lot about learning and talked a lot about simple things that we could do. And when we're talking about the workplaces, it is simple things that we can do. In fact, the whole everything we've talked about is simple. There are simple solutions. We don't have to always think about lots of money. And I'll give you an example. Where I work, having one hand, I have to get through three doors, three fire doors, you know, the big ones, the heavy ones that are close shut. Now, if I go and get myself a coffee, heaven forbid if I go and get someone else a coffee as well, I cannot get back to my desk. Now, the simple solution would be, is a nice little shelf, not too imposing, next to every door. Then whether it's a coffee, whether it's my laptop, whether it's whatever it is I'm carrying, I can put it down to open the door. Okay. Simple, it would cost about five pounds. Can't say much, though, because I'm the budget holder and I could have actually done that. Uh, <laughs> 
What people said about all of those accessibility questions that we put in there was, it doesn't take much effort to make premises and services accessible to everyone, just the will to do it. Our next theme, more than 70% of islanders perceive that people are disabled by barriers and inaccessible locations, services and daily activities due to the attitudes of society and the way things are designed. I had to read that several times before I understood it. Probably not very bright, you've probably all got it already, but it's due to the attitudes of society and the way things are designed. Now, I know you might be thinking that's negative, but to me, that's brilliant. That's positive, because one of the easiest things to change is people's attitudes are through education and learning. If they were telling us it's down to all the old buildings in Jersey and we've got to knock them all down and rebuild them all step by step, Garen and Rock would be rubbing their hands, but the rest of us would be thinking this is going to take a long time and a lot of money. But if it's down to attitudes and belief of society, we can all work together. We are all responsible for our own attitudes and educating people around us and educating each other. There's the spread of answers for that one. 36% of 17 to 24 year olds voted, voted for 10, which was completely matches my understanding. 22% of 55 to 74 year olds voted for 10. What people said on that subject. Non-disabled people should adapt to enable disabled benefits to fit in. It is not a choice to be disabled in any way and more should be done to allow for in the inclusivity of disabled people. I'm going to come back to that point in a minute on my, on my next slide. Another quote was said, I have autism and I have talents as many do with autism. A world that allows us to flourish would be great just by changing attitudes and beliefs of society. It would be great. Next thing. People with a disability were considered as productive as non-disabled people in the majority. This is brilliant. I'd have been very worried if it had gone largely the other way. However, when I was 16 years old and was employed at Lloyds Bank as a data inputter, I was inputting data and my uh, manager said to me, well, we'll have to change your targets. I said, why is that? He said, well, you've only got one hand. You can't type as fast as everyone else. You go half the speed, so we'll have to half your targets. Now, foolishly, as a 16-year-old, I probably should have said, yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine, but it makes this, this bonus-related pay, great. Uh, what I did do, what I did just point out to them was it's not about disability. It's not about work. It's actually about a skill. Uh, so I changed him to a typing contest. And I could type much faster with one hand than he could with one with two hands. So <laughs> it is there. People do think disabled people are less productive than able-bodied people. However, not in Jersey. So there were three questions here. Uh, I've left them together just because it's nice to lump them here. So we've got disabled people in general are not as productive as non-disabled people. Look at that, strongly disagree. It's excellent. Again, already that is an attitude out there in Jersey. We can jump on that. We can go along with that and work together because there's people out there who believe already. The next question was, we should make everything accessible, everything accessible to all regardless of cost. Now, look, strongly agree and agree. I was so surprised by that, mainly because of the words, regardless of cost. Because I would have thought that would have put people off saying agree or strongly agree, but it hasn't. Again, there's the desire there. Everyone is already wanting to work together to make Jersey more inclusive. We can see the benefits. The final question related to this was, disabled people need to adapt to fit in. Disabled people need to adapt to fit in. Okay, here's a controversial for you. I agree. My ethos has always been that it's my disability, I will own it, I will change for what's going on around me. However, before you all start throwing things at me, uh, even I have to admit that there is also something called the impossible. Not the I can't, not that I can't do this, because quite often if I'm saying that, what I really mean is I don't really want to, I'm a bit bored and I can't be bothered. It's the impossible. So even with someone like myself, I, I, I've got to admit there's impossible things that I cannot do. And I need others 
to step in and adapt to make the environment inclusive. So actually, do we, should we be all adapting as disabled people to the things around us? Or should actually we be all working in partnership, meeting halfway or 75% or 25% of the way, whatever it takes to help all of us with disabilities to be able to become more inclusive and be able to get more involved, to help all of us in Jersey to be more inclusive. I might need security to walk me to my car after that. <laughs> 76% uh, of the votes for strongly agree on if disabled people are as productive came from people who are disabled. Answering strongly disagree on disabled people needing to adapt. 51% of the people with disabilities answered strongly disagree. 43% of non-disabled people answered strongly agree. Excellent. It's another positive fact that we can work on from this survey. Next thing, a clear need was identified for more training and learning about disabilities. I've been threading this throughout because it is true and it came out quite glaringly, even according to the people that know what they're doing analysing these surveys, that actually this was a common thread throughout. During the free text question, all these answers were put in and those of you who've used these sort of word arts before is the bigger the letters, the more often they were said. Now this was from everyone. Anyone that filled in the survey, this is what the results were. So the bigger the letters, so there's no support regarding career and future. Shortage of disabled access in retail buildings. More learning and training on disabilities required. That was everyone's feedback. The same if we just filter out and look at the people with disabilities, what they said. More training, learning on disabilities required. Again, is one of the largest ones there. It's the theme throughout, it's the thing we can change the quickest, it's the thing we can all take responsibility for doing. It's the thing we can all help to contribute towards as this turns into an action plan for Jersey to be able to move forwards to make Jersey more inclusive. That is it. Hopefully, this is just the start of the conversation and that we can move forwards with this. I'd like to thank all of you for listening to me and I'll hand you back to Nelson. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Stuart Penn. We're going to take a five minute break now, and then when we come back, we have another, well, it'll be questions and answers. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Embrace Our Differences. Um, gives me the greatest pleasure to introduce the Right Honourable Lord Blunkett. Firstly, thank you very much indeed for a, a, a warm welcome and for the invitation to contribute to tonight's event and to the dialogue and discussion and the campaigns that, uh, that you're running. Uh, I was once uh, on a stage and I actually had a guide dog that had taken itself off and uh, I realised it had gone but I didn't know quite how to handle it so I picked the harness up and said oh my god the dog's disappeared and of course tonight as you can see I've got a harness but I haven't got a dog uh, and actually it's because he's been taken off to be fed so those who li like dogs you're very welcome after this session um, to say hello to the dog because it's usually the dog that people want to say hello to. Uh, and it's been incredibly good to take my ego down over the years um, to know that. I'm, I'm very pleased that so many people are uh, joining in here this evening, including the minister responsible here in Jersey and uh, obviously those who are representing, including the Lord Lieutenant and the, ba uh, the bailiff, um, the Queen, and it's really good that you've been able to piggyback on the survey that Stuart's just described because actually just having a survey changes people's thinking. They have to think about the answers, they have to engage with the issue and that's very good in its, its own right. 
Um, I've only been to Jersey once before, and that was just over 20 years ago when I was Education Secretary. And I came for a, the National Association of Head Teachers Conference, and they plied me with a lot of wine the night before, thinking that I would obviously uh, offer up more money or say something really nice about them. And I did the conference and, flown, and flew back. This time, at least Margaret, my wife and I, are going to be able to hear, hear, be here until Sunday morning, which will be a great pleasure. And when we arrived at the airport, I had the usual experience at airports. I came down with the dog from the, the plane, and what was waiting at the bottom of the ramp? A wheelchair for me. Uh, you, you get this in every airport I've ever been to, the immediate presumption is that you should be pushed into a wheelchair. And once it got into such an argument with the service provider that I actually did get the dog and myself into the uh, contraption just to satisfy them. And I thought afterwards, I'm doing something about this, which I did in a gentle way. I didn't used to do things in a gentle way. Uh, when I was in my late teens and early 20s and things went wrong, they ended up with me being what was then a, an extremely bumptious young man. But when you're lifted across a road by the, uh, the armpits, by somebody who thinks that they're doing you a favor when you were only waiting for somebody, uh, then it's not surprising that you get a little bit tetchy. And I just wanted to say tonight that there is no day zero. There's not a point when we get this right. There's a point when we want to make major change and then we have to build on it. And you're in the process and have been since the legislation in 2013, and Stuart referred to what was happening before the pandemic, in making that change. And I hope that the work you've done, the campaign, the survey, the initiative that you're showing, the four principles that you've laid out will actually be another booster, because we're talking about booster jabs these days. Uh, I'm having mine a week tomorrow. Uh, we, we, we need a booster to actually put a rocket under everyone concerned. And everyone concerned is all of us. It's not someone else's job out there. It's all our job. And I just want to just emphasize this because people may say, well, it's all right for you, isn't it? You're a member of the House of Lords, got in the British cabinet for eight years, was leader of Sheffield. It must have been a damn sight easier for you than it is for us. And I get that, except when I was a kid, I went to a school that didn't do any qualifications. The head teacher had a PhD, but he didn't think that blind children should be put in for public examinations. So at 16, I didn't have any qualifications at all. And qualifications, as we all know, for all of us, whatever our background or disability, actually is the gateway to being able to progress. It can be vocational, it can be academic, but some chance to prove yourself is absolutely crucial. So at 16, I had to go down to evening class at the technical college, start to build up what was then O-levels and then get on to A-levels. Took me six years to get to university. Now, that was a learning curve for me, but it also made a difference to my view of the world, partly, an angry young man, as I've just described, but secondly, a determination, if I could, to actually change that situation for other people with a range of disabilities. Special needs, as we might call it as well, because some disabilities, as Stuart was describing, are clearly visible, some are unseen and invisible, and some require just a, a, a moment of a helping hand, which I will come to, to turn that challenge into nothing. It's not a disability if we overcome the barriers that make it a disability. So I want, I'm going to try and make you smile later on with true stories, but I just want to use the three A's that I put down on my bit of braille paper. Attitude, access and assistance. And by assistance, I mean support, but I like the three A's, so I thought I'd put assistance rather than support. And these build on what Stuart was describing earlier. Uh, William Blake, in one of his poems uh, in the collection London, talks about mind-forged manacles. Now, think about that for a moment, mind-forged manacles. What we're really challenging 
with attitudes to disability is those mind-forged manacles. Often, it's not the fault of the individual. They may not have come across someone with a disability or special need in their life before. They may not have experienced it at school. They may have a subliminal, they wouldn't admit it, a subliminal fear or perhaps more accurately uncertainty about how to approach someone with a disability, how to deal with the physical circumstances that might arise, how in other words to adapt themselves to the circumstance and that's why when Stuart talked about education uh, and the development of training, I think light touch training, people don't want to be sent on rigid courses to be lectured. They want to be taken through what it's like and then make their mind up for themselves. I did some work before the pandemic with the airline EasyJet trying to improve their operation in terms of people requiring support. They have funny titles for it, but that's what it amounts to, whether it's disability, seen or unseen, whether it's aging, whether it's uh, mental health and dementia problems. And one of the things that we got them to do was to get some of the senior staff to wear one of these incredible suits that mean you can you know you actually need to propel yourself as though you've got a major obstacle to overcome and learn to use a wheelchair and to actually experience it themselves because there's nothing like actually feeling how someone else feels to make a difference i don't like the idea of putting a blindfold on people and then just shoving them out in a main street and wishing for the best because the chances of them having an accident are very great. But there are ways in which people can learn what it's like not to be able to see. It doesn't mean they'll immediately understand and adapt, but it's a, it's a stepping stone. So changing attitudes is fundamental. I do work with the Royal National Institute for the Blind, but I also do it with the Vision Foundation. Uh, which is primarily at the moment based in London, they just did a survey of their own. Actually, the figures were more worrying than your figures, Stuart. Not in terms of people's perception of uh, what needed to be done, but people's perceptions of what might be done. Employers, overwhelming, over 90% of the employers that they surveyed didn't think that a disabled person could adapt or... The circumstances could be adapted to that person with a disability working in their workplace. That is staggering. And I'll come in a moment to what we do in terms of action, but we've got to overcome other people's preconceptions, presumptions about us. And the way to do that is that it's all about each of us. When I was in government, I was responsible for the disability uh, portfolio. I, I, I devolved it to a minister, but I also made it clear publicly in Parliament and beyond that this wasn't an issue for someone designated, as Judy is, to take on the ministerial portfolio. It was a matter for every member of Parliament, for every local councillor, for every employer to start thinking about it and to become an advocate. Because once it's just an issue about us, who have got a disability, then it's somebody else's problem and somebody else's issue, and it isn't. It's all of ours. So that's a fairly fundamental uh, point. I inherited the original Disability Discrimination Act. William Haig was actually responsible as the minister in the Conservative government uh, in 95, and he had a hell of a struggle. He's, the minister before him actually lost his job and got himself in a terrible state because the government weren't making progress and William persuaded them that they had to take the basic steps, not because legislation on its own would actually change the world, but it set the framework and the, and the landscape in which other people would operate. And then I introduced the Disability Rights Commission, which was eventually incorporated into the Equality and Human Rights Commission in 2010. By the way, I think it was a mistake. I think simply lumping everything together and pretending that the big E, equality, actually will work, doesn't. And the issues around disability rights 
have taken a substantial back seat to other issues under the heading of equality. So it's, it, legislation can help, but it's only a contribution. I also was responsible for introducing uh, measures in terms of special needs in, in terms of our education system, a long, long way still to go. So what, is, what are my messages? Firstly, you, it's prevention, not cure. You have a tribunal, don't you, and it provides awards. Um, the problem with tribunals and awards is it's trying to compensate monetarily for something that's happened that has already created the blockage, the damage, the barrier. And we, we've got to try and ensure that we don't spend money on, I don't know how much you spend in Jersey, but how much you spend are on actually compensating people for something that shouldn't have happened in the first place rather than putting it right. I don't think, Stuart, the people would for a moment vote uh, the, the, the money to put every possible problem right. I just don't believe they would. They tell us, uh, speaking with my hat on as a politician, I'm not doing party politics tonight, but with my hat on as a politician, people always tell you what they want, but when they get in the polling booth, they vote for something entirely different. Uh, and if you don't understand that, you end up in opposition. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think you've got the point. I'm not here tonight to tell you what to do. Jersey is special. It's not just because it's an island, you are, you are different. Your, your uh, changes, your progress have to be yours. It's about Jersey. It's for the people of Jersey, by the people of Jersey. You will make the change. And the only message I can give on that is that it will be a battle. It's always going to be a battle. When I first stood for the council in Sheffield, fourth biggest city in the country, uh, the struggle was to persuade people locally that I could do it. I mean, I experienced all kinds of things as a councillor and then as an MP in terms of other people's attitudes. Sometimes I didn't know about them until someone afterwards told me. But the only way I could deal with it was to prove them wrong, was to actually just get on with it. And we stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. The people who have campaigned against the odds when things were really difficult and made things happen. So you're, and I am, standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. And other people will, as they make progress on the back of what we do. Sometimes we have to make people laugh and sometimes we have to laugh at ourselves to get a point across. I mean, dogs have been part of my life for over 50 years now and we've had some tremendous incidents with dogs. I remember uh, when I first got a guide dog, Pedigree Labrador, absolutely wonderful dog, diabolical guide dog, actually. Uh, I, I've had seven and the, the one I brought out to... Jersey is a wonderful dog, actually, as, as an all-rounder, because they're all very different, uh, an all-rounder, be best dog I've, I've had, which is remarkable. Ruby entertained people. Ruby would pick sandwiches, meringues off trolleys as we passed them without even flinching. I, I couldn't feel the movement at all. All I knew was that when we sat down at a committee table, I could hear a crunching going on underneath. And eventually people would tell me uh, what Ruby was up to. I would get off buses and I would hear a cry and a parent would explain to me rather hysterically that my dog had just taken the ice cream out of the child's hand. So I used to carry little bits of change with me in order to compensate like the tribunal um, and to try and make up to them. But actually dogs also broke the ice. I mean, dogs are great, which you can't do with a wheelchair uh, or a, uh, a, a, a frame. Uh, and you certainly can't do it if the person doesn't know that you have a disability. So you, there are advantages in having the dog because it breaks the ice. People will say hello to the dog when they don't know how quite to address you, when they don't know whether to ask you whether you want to cross the road or whether you needed a helping hand. They'll start with the dog and then they'll say, do you need a helping hand? And I want to combine 
the need, and Stuart, you mentioned it, the need sometimes for a helping hand and just to recognise when that would be helpful with also the educational uh, impact that that can have as you explain to people what it is that you need them to do. I mean, a very simple message I put out when I'm asked at conferences or when I've gone into schools or colleges is people say, well, what, what, what's the best approach? The best approach is just to ask, can I be of help? What can I do? Is there something that would be of help? If there isn't, that's fine. Uh, if there is, to do it as sensitively as possible uh, without uh, uh, creating e either embarrassment for the individual you're supporting or, or for yourself. I, I want to tell you a story about Her Majesty the Queen. I did get permission um, to do this, so don't worry. <laughs> I won't be arrested and you, the bailiff's not quite like our bailiff, but <laughs> still worry about it. When I was leader of Sheffield, the Queen came to open some new facilities and I had the privilege of sitting next to her as leader of the council uh, for lunch, but I'd made the mistake, you should always prepare on these occasions. I hadn't actually asked what we were eating and it was Barnsley Chop. Now, for those who don't know about Barnsley Chop, it's one of these massive uh, series of cutlets, as you would call them. <laughs> uh, and like everyone else, it had the fat and the meat and the bone. But if you can't see, getting the fat off the meat and the meat off the bone in public is a nightmare. And I set about this with my usual tenacity, determined to prove my complete independence. When the Queen, God bless Her Majesty, said to me, Mr. Blunkett, you seem to be having difficulty uh, with the meat. And of course, on occasions, you're so embarrassed or so pig-headed that you simply say, no, Your Majesty, I'm doing actually very well. And that's what I said. And a minute or two later, she said, Mr. Blunkett, it doesn't look as if you're doing too fine to me. And I said, I I'm managing, Your Majesty. And she said, look, don't be embarrassed. I cut the meat up for the corgis. I'm happy to do it for you. <laughs> and do you know, to this day, I wish I'd accepted her first offer because it's a better story to say that the queen cut your dinner up <laughs> than it is to say that you declined. And I learned a lot from that. I learned that it was a genuine offer and that whatever the magnitude of the occasion and whatever you feel the embarrassment sometimes just to say yes actually helps there have been other occasions when as someone who can't see and th those who have got learning disabilities those who are wheelchair users uh, those who are misunderstood because they have autism will understand that sometimes things go wrong and you have to have a sense of humor yourself and you also have to get over the embarrassment and the difficulty. When I was Education Secretary, we were down in the East End of London opening a very new nursery school. And Tony Blair was with me. And you know what it's like in these schools for small, for small people? You sit on these little stools, and I was desperately trying to be a, you know, as, as least pompous as I could be. I was trying to learn to be a really friendly politician, which is not always easy. And I sat down on this little stool and I put my arm out around the little person next to me and I said, how old are you, my dear? 23, she said. <laughs> Turned out to be a nursery nurse. And of course, as Home Secretary, I'd have probably had to have done something about myself. Um, but it was one of those you know, moments when, what do I do? I said, well, I'm really, really sorry. She said, it's absolutely fine. I should have introduced myself, which is true, actually. She should have said that when she was sitting next to me because I thought it was one of the nursery children. Uh, and, you know, you learn as you go along and people learn with you. Went into the Department for Education and Employment way back in those, my for me, halcyon years of 97. And it was fairly well known, all of us knew, including my predecessor, Gillian Shepherd, who's also a member of the Lords and I, 
get on with really well, that we were going to win. We didn't know by how much, but it was pretty clear that we were. And so they prepared, and they'd got early computer system linked up to a Braille printer. And they were really excited. They printed out this Braille for me. First occasion I was going across to Downing Street to do a presentation to the Prime Minister. And I opened the folder, and the Braille was complete gobbledygook. I couldn't read a word of it. And I went back to the department and I said, it didn't matter, because I knew the stuff backwards. I'd been the shadow for two and a half years, so I knew the stuff. And I said, in any case, you know, I'm pretty good at ad-libbing, and Tony didn't notice, so that was fine. And they said, well, we have to find out, Secretary of State, what the problem is. And they shot off, and they came back about half an hour, 40 minutes later, they said, we found out what the difficulty is. I said, what was the matter? They said, we bought the printer from Sweden, and it's not been switched over. So I got Swedish Braille. Uh, and I, I, I thought to myself, what a generous thing that they thought about getting this all together. But how much better might it have been if they chatted it through with me before they set it up? So good intentions. The one thing I did really appreciate when I was in government was being able to develop something called Access to Work. It's the program, I'm sure you have something uh, similar here in Jersey, but the Access to Work program is operated by the Department for Work and Pensions, where I was Secretary of State for a short time. And uh, the proposition was put to me when I walked into the department that as part of the budget cuts they were involved with, was actually cutting the access to work program. And I said, that's about as insane a proposition that I've ever heard whilst I've been in public life. The access to work program in the UK, however you decide or replicate or adjust it here in Jersey, is the most phenomenal way of ensuring that people can be independent. It offers employers the opportunity to adapt premises, to buy equipment, to get the facility, or to have someone who can be the immediate aid to someone with a disability. It's the opening of a door for the individual to be able to show what they can do and to work on equal terms. It's got its major flaws because it should be attached to the individual, not to the job. It should be available right the way from the training program or skills program or learning program all the way through. and. Uh, Conservative Peer and I co-chaired a, a commission recently on disability in further and higher education. One of our recommendations was that we adapt the program so that when you're in school and you get what is now a, um, a, a plan that was part of the 2000, we had a 2013 uh, act which brought in the, uh, the health and care plans. If you get a plan, and you're very fortunate to get it, then the resource should go with it. But that plan's not carried forward into further and then into higher education or into employment or apprenticeships, which it should be. So the, the seamlessness of what we do, so you don't have to jump through the hoops over and over again. If you can make that work, then it's a lifelong program that enables people to have that independence. And once somebody's earning, uh, and contributing, then they are on equal terms with those around them. Then you can obviously see how the other parts of changing attitude, of accessibility, and of assistance, of support, can come into place. And I appreciate, for those with motor difficulties, physical access is absolutely fundamental. And over time, it is possible to change that. We've passed an act, which has not yet been implemented in Westminster, for the massive renovations that the government now don't want to do uh, in terms of this historic uh, World Heritage Site that's falling to bits called the Palace of Westminster. And I was able to move amendments from the House of Lords about accessibility and disability when people were arguing that there are parts of the historic palace which simply could not be accessible. It's rubbish. Of course they can. They just need creative imagination that doesn't damage the heritage but opens up 
the ability to work and to be on equal terms, including people visiting as well as people working in the palace. And we've still got to, to do that. But it was a struggle. I mean, we're only talking about three years ago when we were arguing this, two years ago when the Act was actually passed. You know, you'd think it was back in the 1920s or 30s to hear people talking. Then, of course, afterwards, wasn't they? They weren't blocking it. They weren't asking the questions at all, were they? But, you know, that's the world we live in. And we change things by changing minds. So I want to leave you with a thought, because I think, as I said earlier, this is a two-way street. People with disabilities of any sort have to be campaigners, but not just in their own right, for what they need for themselves, because each one is an individual. They're not a community, as people often say. We're individuals with our own needs and requirements. They're a campaigner for themselves, but they're a breaker of new ground for other people who come behind them, changing those attitudes, creating the assistance, opening up access. But the society as a whole has to be prepared to respond. So it's a two-way street. There was a, a rabbi called Rabbi Lionel Blue, who used to be on our Radio 4 program. We have this thought for the day on Radio 4's Today program. And he did it for years. I actually did get to know him. And he gave me permission to use this story so nobody can get ufty about whether I've stolen a, a Jewish story from a Jewish rabbi. And it's about uh, Reuben, whose uh, house is being repossessed. His business has gone bust. And he goes down to the synagogue on a Saturday, week after week. And after about six weeks, the Lord has simply had enough of this. And a booming voice comes down to Reuben. Reuben, my boy, the Lord helps those who helps themselves. And Reuben said, but Lord, what is it you want me to do? And the Lord said, for God's sake, buy a ticket. You won't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. You won't change the world unless you put your shoulder metaphorically to the wheel. You won't bring about change unless you can persuade others to join you. This is what you're all about today, this evening. That's what the survey, that's what the campaign, that's what the group here tonight is all about. It's changing minds, changing access, changing the availability of assistance, making the world a better place for all of us. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the Right Honourable Lord Blunkett. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Malcolm Ferry to facilitate the question and answer for Mr. David. I'm sorry, the Right Honourable right, David. David. Right, David, David Blunkett. <laughs> Use it and then we start, that's very kind. Thank you. We'll, we'll share microphones. So, um, yeah, welcome to our island. I hope your stay is enjoyable. We've been rather spoilt this week, uh, whereas we had Baroness Hale earlier in the week and now your presence. So it's, it's been a very exciting week for the island. Um, but perhaps if I can start, Lord Blunkett, by asking you, what's your proudest moment in politics? I think actually, I mean, I've been asked this question many times. I think actually it's been over the, the many years I've been in public life to just demonstrate that you can do it. I mean, do it my own way, obviously, and with all the ups and downs and 
blockages in the road and all the rest of it. But actually to do that, I mean, I've been really proud of things I did at education in the UK, proud of the time I was in the Home Office, which was a, at the moment of the 9-11 attack in the United States and mm -hmm. all we had to do with that. But actually, in the end, what, what lasts is the things that change people's thinking. And that's what I was trying to say in the speech, really. And the best way of doing that for me was not to preach, actually. I've done a bit of preaching, haven't I? But not to preach, but to just show that it can be done. And in that way, to try and nudge people. We're, we're in, everybody loves, in the UK at the moment, the nudge theory mm. uh, in terms of where, how people's attitudes and behaviour changes. So that was that. Thank you. I have a microphone that you works now. Good. Thank you. Good. Good. Blanket. Um, thank you for that answer. So when you were standing for election yourself... What obstacles did you face? What challenges were there on the campaign trail? I think initially, when I was standing as a, seeking to be nominated by my party as a councillor, it was just practical things. People ask, I was very glad they asked me the questions because the worst situation is where somebody's got something in the back of their mind that is a blockage, but they won't ask you about it. So you can't explain how you're going to get over it, what you're going to do. Hmm. Somebody said to me, well, there are really practical things, David. You know, like if so and Mrs. Jones's drains are blocked, what do you do? I said, well, I won't put my arm down. You know, <laughs> I'd ring up what was then the public health department. The name's changed, but there it is, and I'd get something sorted for us. So it was a simple question, a misunderstanding. People, when I was seeking to be an MP, were really reluctant to, to ask how are you going to manage the volume of written material? Because that's a really good question for a blind person. How are you going to manage? And of course, in those days, we used old fashioned cassettes. I still use them, actually, because I like them, um, as well as beginning to get into the 21st century with digital. There was no computerization. Computers have been transformational for all kinds of reasons for people with disabilities. Still a long way to go because the the way that they're designed is all, all often appalling. I I've got a really old-fashioned phone. If I can find it, I'll show it you. It's, it's one of these old Nokia's oh, yes. because they're dead easy to use. Yeah. The iPhone is a nightmare, mm. um, even with the Siri function. So it, it was literally saying to people, "I know what I can do. I I can't drive a bus or fly a plane." although eventually people will be able to, although I certainly wouldn't fancy flying with a blind guy in the pilot seat, honestly. Yeah. Um, you can't always rely on technology. Um, but you know what you can do and you know what you can't do. Mm -hmm. And you need to be engaged. That's really what tonight's about, isn't it? You need to be engaged with the process. Yeah. So it's co-production, co-delivery. It's people being partners in this in this venture thank you so um we have a situation in jersey where we have an election uh next year a general election and we're slowly moving towards um parties forming um and perhaps that may eventually end up as a full party political system what what advice would you give people who are forming parties right now yeah but be, be careful you don't form parties because it seems a good idea to form parties um, only form parties if there's a genuine uh, value-driven difference that actually can uh, then highlight genuine dem democratic participative differences of, of view. Um, I only say that because I addressed the Association of Local Councils last week, which is parish and town councils, some of them quite large towns that have um, subsidiary councils in, in the UK. And very few of them are divided on par party political lines, although that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are members of parties standing. Mm. But at the particular level, you need to get it right for yourselves. Right, the answer to the question, don't stand unless you're going to stand for everybody. Don't stand, I mean, seeing you've asked me, I'll be controversial. Don't stand on a disability platform. Mm. Stand on a platform for the people that you want to vote for you for every aspect 
of their lives. One part of that will be equality in relation to diversity and inclusion. Mm. So it will be, a, a, for some it will be a more critical part than others. But you're standing for what you stand for, who you are, and what you will do. Have courage to do it, but don't expect people to give any inch because you're disabled, because they just don't. Politics isn't like that, and nor should it be. We don't want to be patronised. No. It's not about paternalism. No. It's about giving people a chance. Yeah. But, but how do, does everyone encourage people with lived experience to stand for election? How, how do well, we... those, are, those around them not, don't just encourage, but say, we'll be there with you for the difficult bits, for the canvassing of people. Mm. A lot of it's telephone and online now, but in my day, you, you went up people's driveways or up the stairways and you knocked on doors. That first dog of mine, Ruby, mm. became schizophrenic. We were going in and out of doorways and passageways took me months to stop her going in doorways and passageways <laughs> instead of straight down the road and people do they might they need a lift they need a car they need a help with the technology mm. so everyone can be part of the team yeah. if the person concerned is willing and confident enough to let them be part of it mm. okay and and people that are uh, um building manifestos and parties that are considering manifestos. How, how do we make sure that those manifestos are inclusive? And I know you partly started to answer that question earlier, but how, how do we make sure that it falls into party thinking? It isn't as easy as it might seem. I'd like to just say that in the campaigns that are being run, all, all those who have an interest, not just people with disabilities are an interest, challenge the candidates and therefore the leadership if you, you have groupings or parties um, as to why not why where is it why is it missing what uh, what's wrong with you that you haven't seen the unseen mm. uh, and th that's part of it secondly building up to it part of tonight is just that it's about raising awareness mm -hmm. awareness comes in all kinds of guises in all kinds of ways and you can do that in the months ahead so that the awareness campaign becomes a natural part of what people are offering when they stand for, for public office uh, next year. I think that would be a, a great thing to do. So it's a rolling program, a rolling campaign. Mm -hmm. But also, I think there's, there's one other aspect that you could put forward and that is alongside the election you could, you could get people, this is none of my business at all, but you could get people to run their own little referendums um, on, um, on building on the, uh, the, the research that Stuart's built on tonight. You could put that research out there uh, and make it part of the, part of the campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, once people are in, that's not the end of it at all. Yeah. That's the beginning. Then you've got to hold the feet to the fire. Mm. Okay, and, and just finally from me, before I open questions up to the floor, um, what's the way back for Labour? Um, long and hard, I fear. <laughs> um, I mean, we've, we got ourselves in a terrible mess, as we did in the 1980s, and I was, I was leader of Sheffield when we lost the 1983 election with a 144-seat majority for our, for our opponents. Mm. Uh, and I'm in the House of Lords when we lost the election uh, in 2019 by 80 seats. So I've been through it again and again. The, the truth is, anyone's only electable if they have two things. They have something that makes them worth voting for, mm. and they don't frighten the electorate to death that what they stand for and what they want to do is so alien to the majority of the people they're talking to. Mm. And if you get those out of juxtaposition, then you're not going to win. So for the Labour Party, it's, it's not simple because we, we... Let me just be... Can I just be political for a second? Yeah. We have a quite remarkable Prime Minister. You couldn't have a, a more disastrous position at the moment in the UK in, in all kinds of ways. Yeah. 
uh, following a, partly following our uh, departure from the European Union. Mm. And nothing sticks. I mean, nothing is making a difference at all. And it's because we have a Prime Minister who is a paramount showman. Mm. He, he knows a little bit. Not, he's not Donald Trump. Don't misunderstand me. He, won't, he wouldn't be leading a, 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 an attack on Westminster mm. uh, because he'd lost an election. But he is a little bit like Donald Trump in the sense that he rides over everything. So mm. if you present Boris with a fact, he'll just say, well, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not really important. It's not really important. And he, and he does it brilliantly. So people out there say to me, and they say on our television and radio, they say, well, it's not really his fault, is it? You know, <laughs> he's only Prime Minister. It's not nothing to do with Boris. It's a brilliant technique. Mm. We don't have it. And we're going to have to find a different way of winning over people yeah. to the things we stand for and the fact that what we stand for is them. Mm. And unless we do that, we'll lose again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I think, I believe we've just got time for one question yeah. from the floor. Somebody who's burning. Yeah. Who, who's got a question from the floor? Is there a microphone for, yeah, okay. I'm so pleased to hear you talking about Westminster, the building, and how it's not secret. I mean, I or Paul always thought that it, the best thing they could do would be to move it to somewhere like Sheffield, not necessarily Sheffield. But at what point do you say, in the interest of accessibility for everybody, that buildings, even as important as that, should be replaced in their entirety? Did you ever... Did, was that ever a question you had to ask yourself? Yeah. Am, am I talking to the blogger? I'm afraid you are. <laughs> <laughs> I pick things up fairly smartish when I come to things after all these years. Um, we did consider Westminster becoming a museum because in part because of its heritage and the salience of the buildings and its uh, immediate proximity to Westminster Abbey and now to what is the Supreme Court, it, it's, it would have made an ideal heritage site. But the massive feeling was that we should retain the activity in the building which is where the challenge is, because it's going to cost billions to actually bring it up to date and make it usable again. And it will also take us six, seven, perhaps eight years out of the building, if we do it properly, uh, to be able to do it. And people are really worried about doing that. I'd love to have Westminster in Sheffield. Well, actually, thinking about it, perhaps not, because it might damage Sheffield, um, because it is a very introvert big village within a big city uh, and it's amazing how you get sucked in and the great advantage I had as a member of parliament was to be able to go back to Sheffield to my roots to hold advice surgeries to go into community meetings at the weekend to go to the football at Hillsborough for people to tell me what they thought about me and sometimes very robustly and then to give me a hug because that's the kind of city I come from, they can tell you the truth and still like you and sometimes love you. And that escape from Westminster back to the city and to Derbyshire, which I love as well in the Peak District, that saved my sanity, but it also probably saved my politics. Thank you. Lord Blunkett, it has been a great pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Here. Thank you, Malcolm Ferry, and thank you, Right Honourable Lord Blunkett. Up next, we have Angela Goddard and the Deaf Choir. So it's I am not a stranger to the dark. Okay. Yeah, okay. Hide away, okay, thank you. say, because we don't it's want your broken really. parts. I'm going to be. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
Um, can I introduce us first? We are not the deaf choir. We are actually the Inclusion Project oh, and Friends Choir, just so you all know who we are. Right. We're going to do two songs tonight, sign songs. The first one's going to be This Is Me. You coming, Cameron? Cameron, you coming? Oh, come on. Stand at the back. No? You did 1,000 years. Cameron. Okay. Cameron. Okay. Okay. So the first one we're going to do is in British Sign Language, um, which and, is. And this. I'm sorry. And this song's called This Is Me from the Great. From the film The Greatest Showman. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. And the second one will be um, A Thousand Years, which is in Makaton. And Ella, on the end here, will be signing it in BSL, in British Excuse Sign me. Language. Excuse me. No, no. I'm doing for signing language. Thank you.
thanks for coming. You are welcome. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Helen. One more song. Come on. Thanks. Come on, one more song, everybody. One more song, one more song, one more song, one more song. Thank you.
Excuse me. Thank, thanks for coming for singing sign language. Signing language. Sign language of oh, its chords. Thank, thank you for signing language choir. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Inclusion Project and Deaf Choir. We have reached that time of the evening where we would like to say thank you very much to all the uh, people that have attended here today. And a special shout goes out to all the projects that have turned up here today that have presented themselves. So thank you very, very much. Uh, and apparently we have had a lot of online viewers and there were questions that were being asked. You will have those answers given to you by the Inclusion and Disability Committee. They will get back to you. My name's Nelson Terrace. I'd like to finish off by saying good night, God bless, and thank you very much. Good night.